it's an, uh, an honor for me to be able to actually speak about this. Um, it is because of the historical importance and the implications for the near and further future, not just for Jackson or not just for Mississippi or the Black Belt South, but for all oppressed and working people in this country. Um, simply, I think that when the most oppressed of us is lifted, then it lifts the entire working class. And I think that this particular, this, this historic event, you know, it shows that the, the, the way that, the reason that he was able to get elected, that shows the maturity of black oppressed workers in Jackson, Mississippi, to pick someone who has that unique radical revolutionary history being involved in the struggle, especially around fighting for self-determination and independence of black, oppressed black people in this country. So it bodes well for the entire class. Um, but also because I trace my roots to Mississippi. When I was very, very little, I thought that all black people came from Mississippi. <laughs> and I thought that because where I grew up, everybody traced their roots to Mississippi. And in the summer, all of the kids, whether you want it to or not, you went down to Mississippi to spend time with your grandparents. So I spent parts of my summers there. My brothers and I, um, my cousins, we all went down there to spend time with the grandparents, both sides. And it is also where my brothers and I went to bury our mother. And though she lived in Tennessee, she passed away in Chattanooga, actually Udawa, outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. It was her desire to be buried next to my grandparents, her mother and father, to take that last plot of land right next to them. And so we buried her in Bay Springs, Mississippi, which is right next to Laurel, which is the county seat of Jones County, Mississippi. When we were small, we spent our summers in Laurel and in Heidelberg. And at that time, going down there, I thought it was the hottest, most humid place on earth. I couldn't imagine any place hotter or more humid than Mississippi. It would always turn my hair red, and so when September would come and we'd go back to school, people would remark on how red my hair was. And it permanently dye the bottoms of my shoes red from the red clay in my uncle's driveway and in his yard. I remember vividly the humidity, the smell of stagnant water, and the magnolia blossoms. It felt like somebody put me in an oven with a, a pan full of water, put us in some giant's mouth. It was stifling. You couldn't get away from it. Um, I remember one particular incident where one of my cousins passed away. He drowned, and and it was that day we were all outside waiting to see, waiting for the divers to come and pull his body out of a small pond, and just pouring sweat. It was like underneath our feet we'd created our own pond or lake. Um, that's just how hot it was. So I remember it. And I recall the difference of Mississippi from Erie, Pennsylvania, where I was raised. And I remember our parents telling us when we grew up in Erie, don't be afraid of white people here. If anybody calls you nigger, you make sure that at least for a week or a month they can't open their mouth and call you nigger again. But on the way down to Mississippi, we were always told, you watch what you say and you watch what you do because these white people are crazy. That's what our parents would tell us. And when I was there, you know, I, it seemed to, to me that every time a white person looked at me, they looked at me with scorn. Whether it was real or imagined, that's what it felt like. And, you know, our parents would condition us in that way because of what they faced growing up there during the height of the, the civil rights struggle. Um, and so, it, you know, they put that fear into us. Um, but there was, and I'm going to tell you right now before I even go for I'm not going to sing to you. <laughs> and you don't understand why I say that to you as I continue. Because <laughs> if I did sing, you would be laughing like you're doing now. Or you talk about me later and my ears would be ringing at night. Um, but we all remember the, a particular song that dealt with Mississippi, right? And we remember the artist who sang that song, Mississippi Goddamn. Everybody know that song? So I'm going to repeat some of the words. And I'm not going to sing them. If you want to sing along, go right ahead. Um, I, you know, I always tell people that when I'm alone in the shower, and I, I sing very, very well. <laughs> Just like when I'm dancing in my apartment, I am the greatest dancer the world has not yet seen and never will see. <laughs> but if other people hear me singing, then it's something different. Um, but hound dogs on my trail, school children sitting in jail, black cat cross my path, 
I think everybody's going to be, I think every day is going to be my last. Lord, have mercy on this land of mine. We all going to get it in due time. I don't belong here. I don't belong there. I've even stopped believing in prayer. Don't tell me. I tell you. Me and my people just about do. I've been there so, I've been there so I know. They keep on saying, go slow. But that's just the trouble. Do it slow. Washing the windows, do it slow. Picking the cotton, do it slow. Just plain rotten, do it slow. Mississippi epitomizes the particular struggle, the particular history of the development of capitalism in the U.S. From the war against the indigenous people of the Mississippi area, the Choctaw, Chickasaw, the Tunica Biloxi, and the Natchez, among other indigenous nations. From the occupation by the Spaniards, the French, and the British, by the colonialists as well, to forced removal of indigenous people, to slavery with all of its brutality, to the crushed hopes after the compromise between the former slaveocracy and the capitalist government, to Jim Crow, the experience of oppressed people, and in this particular instance of black people, has been one of a continued war, open and then convert and then open. One so, a war that is so important to the development of the wealth, the initial wealth that allowed for the development of capitalism in the U.S. and the Western European nations. It was the subjugation, enslavement, theft, genocide committed around the world, the primitive accumulation of capital, which made it possible for the development of the Western world and kept the majority of the planet underdeveloped. By the end of chattel slavery in the U.S., Mississippi had the third highest number of enslaved black people, after Virginia, then Georgia, and this number accounted for 55% of the total population of the state. After the Civil War, during Reconstruction, and, and, and after the Compromise, which ended and stopped short of a full democratic revolution, when the Posse Comitatus Law, which was part of it, which removed Union troops from the South, was signed into law, uh, the democratic rights of black people, since black people did not have the arms to protect themselves and didn't have the training that the former Confederate soldiers had, they were left to face the violence of the white paramilitaries who were aligned with the state forces in the South by themselves. Though black people were the majority in Mississippi, South Carolina, Louisiana, and made up more than 40% of other southern states, the experiment of, experiment of reconstruction, which saw universal suffrage, freedom of movement, the institution of public education, and black involvement in the political process, uh, which included black uh, legislators taking office, was ended. During this time, there was a large number of black landowners who were able, many of whom, because of the end of Reconstruction, um, there, there, I'm sorry, there was a, during this time there were a large, a large number of black landowners, many of whom who later lost their, lost their land after the end of Reconstruction. Um, and because one of the things that happened after that, they had written, they had black codes that were written after the, the end of the Civil War, which in a lot of cases did not take effect until after the end of Reconstruction. And so when black own, landowners started to lose their land, which they were able to farm, um, even before the Depression of 1893, the, the being, they had these, these laws where a person can be arrested for being a so-called vagrant, for not have, being able to communicate, for, for not being able to prove where you were going or where you came from or who you were, you could be arrested and then you could be bailed out to the highest bidder to do work, to work off the fines that you were given by the sheriff's, the sheriff's department. The, 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 re, the depression that I sort of mentioned, it, it wasn't just the black farmers who were hard hit, it was farmers all across the country. And, you know, when the Civil War had ended, you saw this great explosion in, um, in, in a, um, manufacturing primarily in the North, as well as the growth of, uh, of a lot of farms in the Midwest and in the South as well, which black people for a short amount of time were able to actually have farms. Um, and so there was a great overproduction of a lot of different goods and the collapse of the markets would owe to the overproduction, which is one of the chief crisis of, of, cap, uh, of capitalism. Um, and so it, it, after that happened, we were introduced to a new form of enslavement called sharecropping or de facto slavery, which wasn't just people who were arrested for made up laws, but also people who had no place else to go. And there was this kind of new institution. It was like being a serf that a lot of black people had to live under. Um, 
And right along the same time as this was happening, you saw the development of the white paramilitary forces, which sort of, which re, uh, reversed the whole process that saw so many black people enter into leg being legislators and there were, you know, there were uh, constitutional conventions that black people were able to take part in the political process all, and all of that for the most part ended um, and you saw, you know, this terror that swept through the south of black people who were, along with having poll taxes which denied people, black people their democratic right to take part in the process. Um, Mississippi throughout its history, if we were to look through the end of Civil War all the way up to the, the 1960s, along with the, the political disenfranchisement that was happening, it was the regular occurrence, the regular violence, the regular occurrence of violence. If you look at last year, the report that was released by the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement that showed that over 300 and I think 13 black people were killed by either police or, um, or by security guards last year alone and I always say that it's it's hard to tell whether or not that number was greater than any other year prior but we just became more aware of it because of technology well during the height of lynching there were more people that were actually lynched per year than that number that was released by the Malcolm X grassroots movement and that occurred in Mississippi and there for all the names that we do know for every Medgar Evers for every Emmett Till there are countless other lives that we will never that we don't know and that we may never ever learn their names so, but you know, there are a number of, of of ones that are more we're more familiar with because either the persons or people were political, or because in the case of Emmett Till, his mother refused to let him go silently, and she bravely, you know, opened this casket to the world to see so they can see what what was done to her her son. Um, but a few days, a week, and a day before. Uh, a week and a day after the election of Chokwe Lumumba, would have, we would have commemorated the 50th anniversary of the murder of Medgar Evers, who was killed in Jackson, Mississippi, in 19, June 12, 1963. Um, and the murder of Emmett Till takes on even more significance now because of the trial that's happening in Florida of the young man Trayvon Martin, who was killed by George Zimmerman. And many people liken that incident to what happened with Emmett Till. Um, so I don't want to go through necessarily all the different incidents, but I just wanted to, to lay out, you know, the whole history of, not the whole history, but parts of the history of Mississippi so we can actually see how important this election of Choco Lumumba actually is with all the violence that, is, that has occurred, um, with, you know, the continued poverty that exists in Mississippi to, to this day, which is the poorest state in the country. Um, where over 30% of people live in poverty in Jackson alone, 36% of people live in official poverty. And of course, we know that the 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 the, the uh, actual cutoff for poverty is is too low, and that there are many people who technically make more than the federal guidelines for being above poverty, but are still actually living within poverty and a paycheck away from being completely destitute and homeless. Um, so this is, but their official number in Jackson, Mississippi is 36%, and 10% live below 50% of the poverty level. Jackson, I mean, Mississippi is also last in health care in this country, and it is one of the bottom states uh, for education. In fact, there is a human development index, which is done in the U.S., I think, yearly, and Mississippi is, is uh, third from the bottom on the human development index in this country. Um, that you know, list the opportunities for advancement and for betterment of one's life. It's third from the bottom in this country as far as states. I don't know the other, the others that are below it. Um, so this is, you know, a brief sketch of the particular history of Mississippi. And actually, one thing I don't want to leave out is a couple of years ago, I think in 2000, 2011, there was actually another, another incident that many people, especially the family of this young person who was found hanged, were saying that he was murdered. Um, and this was in modern, you know, so-called modern times, well, modern times, that this has actually happened. Um, and we don't know the many different cases of discrimination that continue to go there, that continue to go on there, and whether it's police brutality and all of these things, um, they continue to happen to this day. So it makes this particular election that much more important. You know, it is it is uh, kind of surprising that it was able to happen. I think that um, 
it caught many of us by surprise that Chokwe Lumumba was elected mayor of Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and I had gone to the Black Left Unity meeting and he had mentioned that he had talked about running for mayor. And you know, our experience is that whenever a person who was radical, you know, Charles Barron, he ran for mayor of New York City, he didn't get anywhere close of what, to actually winning. He didn't even get out of the primaries. Um, so our experience is someone who has that unique history, someone who was the vice president of the Republic of New Africa, one of the founders of the Malcolm X grassroots movement, um, who was a lawyer for uh, not just the Sada Shakur, but also worked on the case of Geronimo Pratt, has this long particular history of being a, a revolutionary, you know, um, black nationalist. And you, you all know what they, I mean, look at what they did to Charles Barron when he was running for the different offices in here. How they called him a racist. He was a radical. He didn't like white people. He was dangerous. He was irresponsible. All of these things were said about Chokwe Lumumba. And if, as Marxists, we understand that the, the election, universal suffrage, is a gauge of the maturity of the working class, and we would have to, to say, we'd have to analyze this particular event with all of this attack that, is, that, that had to be happening against him, that it shows that the black working class in Jackson, Mississippi is in fact very mature. And they did not allow these scare tactics to separate them from somebody who would fight and struggle in their interests. See, this is much different than the symbolic victory of Barack Obama. It's not that part of the struggle was not for a black face in a high political office, because that was part of the struggle, and I'd be a lie to say if it wasn't. But we all knew that, you know, those who had been paying attention, that he was an imperialist president. And in order for him to, to even get that far and to maintain his position, he was going to have to do the bidding of, the, of the, the ruling class of the U.S. And he wasn't going to do anything necessarily in the interests of working people, unless maybe some large rebellions were to spring, and he had no choice but to save capitalisms to make some concessions, but that wasn't the case. But this is somebody who represents the interests of oppressed people, not just in Jackson, but throughout this country. And if you look at the Jackson Plan, which is a very, very progressive document, one of the things, the vehicle, the organizational form through which they were able to do this comes out of the struggle, you know, um, that arose after uh, the, the government ignored the suffering of oppressed and poor people in Mississippi in the Delta region, in the Black Belt South, after Hurricane Katrina's in Rita. And there was an organization of form that was, that they formed through the Malcolm X grassroots movement that was fighting in the interest of those who suffered the, the effects before and the after effects of those storms. And they developed the Jackson People's Assembly to struggle where they would call an assembly of people. It, it's similar, as Comrade Deirdre Griswold has said in a number of incidents, to the Speak Bitterness meetings in China, where people would come and they would talk about the, the, primarily the landlords that they, were up, that they were fighting against. And you can allow for people, we experienced it in Baltimore last year on June 30th, essentially is it gave voice to people who felt like they had been long ignored. People who are, who are facing occupation by the police in their communities, police harassment and police abuse and, and murder, and felt like no one was paying attention to them, not on the city council, not the mayor, and not any other government official was paying attention to the suffering that they were faced. Because what they would see is that a cop would get away with abuse, and they wouldn't even be called in front of a grand jury. There was never an investigation, and everything they did was justified. Well, these assemblies allow people to actually express their frustrations, but also to talk to someone who they could feel confidently would struggle in their interests. And that's one of the ways they were able to galvanize people. Part of that process is not only giving people, allowing people to have their voice publicly, but it socializes and deep more, much more deeply politicizes people by participating in those types of conversations and those types of meetings. And that was one of the forms, if not the primary form, by which Chokwe Lumumba was able to get elected, not just mayor, but city council before that. And it shows the importance of us developing the assembly movement, not just the People's Power Assembly movement, but workers' assemblies, student assemblies, and there can be many other subdivisions of the assembly movement that we can think of. And it helps people, you know, what this was able to do is it's, it's, 
we don't know exactly what's going to happen going forward. We don't know the opposition that the city council might put up. We don't know all of these things. But we do know through this election that no matter what the city council says, that the people are aroused in Jackson, Mississippi. And that if the person that they chose is, is attacked for any reason, or if any of the Jackson plan is, is attacked and not allowed to actually take shape, then the people will respond to it. I believe we saw this develop in many other countries. We saw it in Venezuela when they had a progressive president who was fighting in their interests and that person was removed and the people responded in the streets by the hundreds and hundreds of thousands. I'm not saying that it's going to happen the exact same way here, but it, there is something bubbling in Jackson, Mississippi. There is something, but I want to mention some of the, the features of the, the Jackson plan. And if you haven't had a chance, you should actually go, I think, on the Malcolm X grassroots movement and you should read it. Um, let me find the place. First, I want to mention how they, how they view the People's Assemblies. Um, the plan looks forward to building People's Assemblies, a concept rooted in the Black Liberation Movement, which seeks to resist the systematic exploitation and terror of white supremacy and exercise and exert some degree of self-determination and a build autonomous power outside of the realm of the state, i.e. the government. Can you imagine? He was elected with this type of plan. But some of the other features, some of the other features, building a local solidarity economy defined as a process of, promo of promoting cooperative economics that promote social solidarity, mutual aid, reciprocity, and generosity. This is an attempt to break with, I mean, we can say how difficult it is to truly build cooperatives within a capitalist system, but this is an attempt to break with you know, the domination, the subjugation of, of black economics by the white supremacist power structure. This is what they are attempting to do, and this is why this is important. Um, oh, I've already spoken 15 minutes. I'm not going to go on too much longer, but I'm just, so I'm just going to wrap up right now. But, you know, I, I did want to say that Many people are going to be going down there. Some of us are going to be going down there July 1st for the inauguration. And I suspect many people within the black left movement are going to be going down there as well. And there have been a number of defeats that we have suffered through the years. We saw the, the destruction of the Occupy movement by the state clamping down on it. You know, we still see movements going on around the country, whether it's in North Carolina, the struggle against the suppression of democratic rights there, whether it's in Selma, Alabama, 500 people walked across, marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma to, to, to defend the Voting Rights Act and to fight against the attacks on Section 5 of that act. <laughs> whether it's in Detroit, Michigan, where Chokwe Lumumba is originally from, where the entire economy of the city of Detroit has been put under financial emergency management and they're leaking to bust the public sector unions to destroy you know the health care of the workers who are in the public sector unions and sell off all the assets in the city this is an attack this is an, a racist attack on a primarily black city anywhere where there is struggle if people had felt that no one was paying attention, if they felt they were losing, all they have to do is look to Jackson, Mississippi. And I guarantee you that this victory, people are going to be talking about it for days, for years. And going forward for this year and into the next year, it means that struggle, the potential for struggle, breaking out, it looks even better. It's looking up. Because when it was once thought that it was not possible for someone like us to get into such a position, to be able to represent our interests. People are used to being told that they, that by some politician that they voted for because they thought that that was, person was going to do something in their interest, that that politician knows better than them. That they may want health care, they may want better education, but the politician knows better that the path towards, you know, um, a better life for them is by cooperating with the system as it is, which means that it's not public education. Public education is the problem. Teachers unions are the problem, so we need to privatize the whole thing. 
this is someone who represents and is going to fight for their interests. So I think it's going to, we're going to see other people going to be trying experiments similar to this, and we're going to see an explosion of the, of the People's Assembly movement. So I, I will, I'll leave you with this, comrades. There is some information that I left out, but I think that if we all want to look at the particulars of the economic situation in Mississippi, we can do that. But as I've been around the country, whether it's from Oak to Oakland, California, or San Diego, or Baltimore, and we talk about people's power assemblies, uh, most people who've never been politicized, who've never been very political, maybe it was their first event that they've gone to, they see the potential in such a movement. And they are excited to have a chance to actually speak about the issues that face them. And this gives further proof that it is possible to build such a thing and that if we fight and we struggle and we organize that we can win and I think that we should go forward wherever we are whether we are in university or whether we are public sector work and we should raise we should raise the specter of building an assembly movement workers assemblies people's assemblies and that this is how we fight for our interests call all the people together we talk about the issues that we currently face we devise a uh, people's program and that we fight and struggle for that and that over time that we create this new power which is the power of the people which I think is, the, what they're, is what they're building in Jackson, Mississippi and it shows that it's possible anywhere even in New York City so thank you all power to the people build the people's power movement <laughs>